going to go into the next session called Project Light. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this because uh, we don't have a lot of time because I want to get into the internet and some of those tools that I think are so phenomenal. Page 44. Project Light is based on what scripture verse? Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men. Now, what is Project Light? Project Light is an outreach to the community that is designed for evangelism from a variety of approaches. And by the way, Project Light incorporates all seven principles of the Tabernacle of David. Is that exciting? So if a church does a Project Light with our ministry, which I just recently got back from New York, we did an outreach in the largest project in America, in Queens, New York. The largest single project. Boy, that church did a phenomenal, phenomenal church. The pastor's from Nigeria. It's mostly a black church. They, they spent over $5,000 on the outreach. They rented the best quality equipment, sound system. They were awesome on the streets. They had booze. It was a festival type of an approach. It was really great. But what is Project Light? It's going out to help the poor. Now, I'm going to go through the steps of this real quickly because the way it's designed is for evangelism even in the neighborhood. I'll give you the full scope of it in just about 10 minutes, and it's not going to take a lot of time. The first thing you do in Project Light is you walk around your block and pray for your neighborhood. Okay? Walk around your block and pray for your neighborhood. What do you pray? You say, Lord... I'm territorializing my neighborhood. Project Light starts with you in your neighborhood. Because I'm going to go to every door around my block in the next hour or so. And I'm going to present them with an opportunity, to, in, an invitation to join up with our outreach. So what I encourage people to do, walk around the block, maybe seven times, one time, however many times you want. Walk with somebody, your wife, your children, whatever, and just pray for every house you walk by. How many times have you done that? Some of you have done that. That ought to be standard for us believers. When you're out walking, jogging, or whatever, or just walking your dog, or just out on the street, walk around your block, claim that block. That's your Jerusalem. Now, the church has printed out beautiful flyers with about 20 items on them defi defining what Project Light is. It's an outreach to the needy and the homeless in the community. And these are the items that we are gathering to take to the homeless. And this is already prepared with a professional looking flyer. So you go up to the neighbor's door and you say this. And it's very important what you're saying. This is what you want to write in here. The presentation at the door of your neighbors is important. It goes like this. Hello. My name is Jerry Brandt. This is my wife, Mariana. We are your neighbors. Why do you say that? Because you're not soliciting. You're just a neighbor. You're a neighbor inviting neighbors to join in with you. I, we're your neighbors. We just live a few houses down from you or maybe around the block. and uh, we, We're excited to meet you. Oh, here is a flyer, by the way, that we want to give you because we're going to be back next Tuesday night and gather as many of these items as you'd like to give us because our church is going out to reach out to the homeless and needy in the city. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is so exciting. You will get just right at a 50% response with your neighbors. If you go to 20 neighbors, 10 of your neighbors will participate with you. So you say... Here are 10 items that we want to give you. Now, we'll be back next Tuesday night to gather these items. And we want to thank you for participating with, with us. We've made our home a temporary kind of a warehouse, a gathering place here in the community for the next two weeks. So the next Tuesday, now you've had one contact with your neighbors, right? Now, the next Tuesday, you go around and you might tell them if you're not going to be here, would you mind setting this stuff up on the porch and... Just make sure it's available. So you get two contact with the neighbors already. Neighbors will ask you, wow, what, what, what church is this? This is exciting that your church is going out to help the needy in our city. It's good. We've actually had neighbors come to the outreach that weren't saved. They just said, where, where are you doing this? We've talked about helping the poor in the city too. This would be a good event for us to go to. Now you have evangelism going on by them coming down to the outreach as a neighbor. There was a man in Sacramento that lived in a very, very, he owned a big real estate company and he could not reach his neighbors. He had tried to reach the neighborhood. 
He handed out his flyers around his block, which didn't have many homes on it because they were very <laughs> large homes. He was so excited, he went down to the church and got a hundred more flyers. I have him on our testimony on our video. He said, this is the only approach I've ever used with my neighborhood that worked. They took two trucks just to gather all the stuff that he gathered from his neighborhood. Neighbors were ready to give out stuff. They just didn't know how to do it. It's a great point of contact with neighbors. So you go around the next Tuesday, you gather them. Now, between the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of the week, you gather the items. You take them over to the church, and they already have designated an area to collate the men's, women's, children's clothing, and the food items into, into sacks or containers. And that's done by Friday night. Now you get ready for the outreach Saturday morning. This gets exciting. You load all the stuff in the truck. We do the training with you, a short version of this training, which is three hours, which you'll see over here. It's called Go Ye Therefore. We do a short version of this training, and then we immediately go out to the streets with the church. We do the outreach with the church. People are trained, equipped, ready to go. They get to experience the same day they get their training how to use these tools. Then the next day, we do a celebration service at the church where we have the homeless come in that got saved, get baptized, and the workers give testimonies of what God did on the streets. This stimulates evangelism in the church. I'm telling you, when the workers get up and say, yesterday I was out there and this happened and this happened, and they give a testimony of what God did through them on the streets. That's basically Project Light. We've been doing this now for 23 years. And I mean, churches love it. I went to a church over in uh, Deland, Florida, eight years ago. Good Assembly of God Church. Mike Modica is the name of the pastor. He had a church of 200 people. We taught him, took him to the streets. I even, we have video of this stuff still. I was watching it the other day that we took eight years ago. He said, Jerry, this was a turning point for our church. They began to do project lights every month for about six months, and then they went to once a quarter. His church grew to over 1,200 people just through Project Lights. He was presbyter for the east coast of Florida Assemblies of God. So one day I was at an Assembly of God meeting, and pastors were coming up to me and saying, oh, we've got a Project Light in our church. I said, I've never been there. Oh, they said, we're with, uh, with Mike Modica. Mike Modica trained 36 other churches in his district to do Project Lights. <laughs> So all up and down the coast, all the way from August, St. Augustine down to Vero Beach, all that whole area are doing Project Lights. I've been doing them for eight years, and I've only trained one church. And he said the key to our church's growth was when we began to take on the neighborhoods and train our people, we became evangelistic, and this has really worked for our church. So we're doing kind of a Project Light with our church with this time. We're not doing the celebration service on Sunday be fun to do that, but I, I never talked to Pastor John about it. But it'd be good to have some of you come back on a Sunday evening and give a testimony of what happened on the streets, of casting demons out of people, healing the sick, praying for people's salvation. It's good. So that's a Project Light. Pretty simple, isn't it? And it works. I just wanted to share that with you because you may be in another church and want to do it. We use prayer. Okay, let's go through the things real quickly. Just to review, we already know this. We use territorial prayer, top of page 46. We use the pulling down of strongholds as you pray. We pray actually at the rally. We'll often do spiritual warfare during the worship. So we use praise and worship, number three. We reach out to the poor and needy. We practice power evangelism. We teach repentance on the streets. And we often have prophecies right down there on the street. So we practice the seven principles of the Tabernacle of David. Did I go too fast for you there? Yeah, they're, 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 they're from back on the Tabernacle of, of David teaching. So you already have those earlier in your manual, so you can fill those. So it's prayer, pulling down strongholds too. Number three, praise and worship. Number four, poor and needy ministry. That's why we're out there. Number five, power evangelism. That's what we're doing with the people. Uh, we're, we're taking them through repentance, number six. And number seven is we're using a prophetic approach with the people as God gives a prophetic word. Oftentimes we'll see prophecies come on the streets, even publicly, declarations. And then we have A, uh, under that. Many churches have, have uh, compassion ministry, but with very little effectiveness. I talk to pastors all the time, say, I had one pastor up in the northeast part of town. He says, we've been doing outreaches on the streets. We've never had anybody saved. We just, he said, all they do is they just come for our food and leave. 
I said, well, you've never learned how to do evangelism with it. This is a great evangelism tool. You need to, un to incorporate evangelism with this. You'll see how that works with us down on the streets next Saturday. So a celebration service, number A, is then held Sunday morning. And after that project light is completed, a church now identifies a whole new group of people excited about outreach. A MAT team is then formed. This ministry action team then continues to do outreach on an ongoing basis. We formed these teams all over Northern California. We had around 200 churches that we had taken to the, churches, to the streets of San Francisco with us over a seven-year period in Northern California. And these churches had MAT teams, ministry action teams. That's a MAT team is a ministry action team. All right? Any questions? All right, let's fill in the blanks for the rest of the time here. I go into a section on page 47 that I think is pretty exciting. And that is how quick Jesus released people to evangelism. We have kind of a mindset in our churches that before you can minister, you've got to go through the new believers class. You've got to prove yourself. I'll tell you, Jesus put him right into the ministry. The hottest evangelists you'll have in your church are new saved people. Let me just give two illustrations. One's a woman at the well. She left her pots at the well, went down to win the city. The other was Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was immediately released to ministry. How do we know this? He went back to every house in the city and gave their money back. Now, wouldn't that be something on CNN? Head of Imran visits every stockholder in the company and repays them fourfold. So every stockholder that lost money on Imran now not only gets their original investment back, they get four times back. Do you think Zacchaeus had a testimony in the city when he repaid everybody that he had stolen from? Man, that guy was in some ministry walking up to every door with money and saying, I owe you. Wait, Zacchaeus, what do you mean? Yeah, I ripped you off a year ago. Here's your money back, and here's three times more. Oh, what, what, Zacchaeus, why are you doing this? Well, I met this man named Jesus. He changed my life, and I repented. What about the demonic that was set free? This is really an interesting story. He wanted to go follow Jesus. He asked Jesus, can I go with you? After he was delivered of the legion of demons. Jesus said, no. He said, go back to Decapolis. What is Decapolis? Ten cities. Just go to those ten cities, run through the city, show that you're now, now clothed and in your right mind. And you're going to have such a witness in those cities. And some of the places that Jesus had a great ministry was in Decapolis. I believe it was this demonic that prepared the way for him. Former demonic, I should say. Some of the greatest testimonies we hear on the streets are guys that got set free on the streets and within a month or so they're down there saying, guys, I got set free and I want you to get this too. It's powerful. All right. So let's not hold people back if they want to witness and share their faith if they just newly got saved. Amen? Now they should go through the New Believers class and they should become disciples, discipled. But Jesus would absolutely immediately put everybody in the ministry that received him. I think we ought to do the same. That was the bottom of the page 47 about that, man. Okay, now let's get into the internet tool. I love this. The latest, greatest tool. And it is, accept, it, it is accessible to all of us. And it can be a powerful, powerful tool. Technology has been raised up by God's wisdom in men to help complete the harvest. Now, Satan has tried to corner this market. Have you ever noticed that? Billions are made with pornography on the Internet. We've drug our feet. Every one of you can have an Internet presence, a blog. Put your story on YouTube. Come on. Tell your story. The story you're writing out is two minutes long. 
They say that's an ideal length for the Internet. So, you know, I've just written my story and I want to share it with you and just tell your story with, into a video camera and then download it on the Internet. Immediately, your story will go worldwide. Is this incredible or what? And it's not going to cost you one dime. We live in the most exciting evangelism period in history. Because it's accessible to everyone. Do you know I just read on CNN that third world countries are doubling their internet subscribers every hundred days. That's in third world countries. Doubling every hundred days. Wow. And that's in the millions of people. And they're all on the internet. And they're finding this new thing, search engine, you know, whatever. And they can run across your story as well as anybody else's. It is very inexpensive. Anybody can open up a web page. Go to Google. Download your domain name for $8.89, I think it is now, or something. Just make up, say, your name, www.johndoe.com, if it's still available. If it's not available, put a, something after it. Get a domain, and you can stay right there in Google, and it'll take you to a little web developer there, and it, it, you just open your website up. It's almost free. Download it. Bang, you're on the Internet with your own website. It's possible. We just don't take the time to do this. We need to. Put your story. Write a few things about yourself. Put your picture there. People are interested. Put your story on there. Not just video-wise, but put it on written. A good illustration of the effectiveness of evangelism is, is what we've done on the Internet. We, we really, we really got, got us in six years ago with a good, pretty good server here in the city. He knew how to code in our words. If you type in today on Google, type in evangelism video on demand, we come up number one in the world in Google out of 440,000 sites. I challenge you, go home, type in Google, just put the word evangelism video on demand, and our console will come up. And in our console is about 30 videos. It's downloaded on a company called Bright Cove. You know how much we paid for that? For that video console? Zero. And we're with, in Bright Cove, we're with Discovery Channel, we're with Time Magazine, we're with uh, all the big boys. We just happen to get in at a good time on that. So you, you find these things on the internet. You can position yourself so people have access to your stuff. That's what witnessing is all about. Bottom of 48, I want to throw this in because this is on the test. I'm trying to figure out why in the world I put this in at this time, except this is what we practice when we develop our, our leadership team. If you want people to build loyalty to you and be part of your group, you've got to do three things. We've taught this to leaders around the world, by the way, and I, 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 we have this on our, our Internet as well. There are three things you can do. Belongingness is group-related. Everybody needs it. Significance is self-related. Everybody needs it. And thirdly, competence is task-related. People want to be part of a group. When you, the, the Internet is full of networking. It's a networking environment. That's what you do on the Internet is you network with people. So we'll fill those three in, all right? We're just almost through with the Internet because I want to spend the last part on the World Harvest. Top of page 49, the website. Get yourself a good server. If you want to be a little more professional, pay them $100 or $200 to professionally develop a nice website for you. There are places out there that will do it. Monster Host is one of the biggest. Go to something like Monster Host. They, cover, they have unlimited bandwidth. They have unlimited pages on your website. They'll register your domain free. Call Monster Host. It's the highest rated hosting service for the general public. Unlimited bandwidth. Man, that's incredible. Incredible. What they, and the reason they do it, they want more hits on their site so they can sell advertising. I'm flying to, see, uh, to Phoenix recently and I pick up U.S. News and World Report. Procter & Gamble spends 
$4.8 billion on internet advertising this year. AT&T is spending $3.6 billion on internet advertising this year. Huge. Do you know that 46% of professionals pick up their news now by video on demand on the internet <coughs> instead of watching the news? So everything is moving toward the internet. Let's capture that as an opportunity to get the gospel out there. You can have a webmaster develop your home page for as little as $100. I know some. If you, I'll introduce you to them if you want. By networking with other effective ministries. We, work, we do this by networking. Networking is a key thing. Somebody gave me a little cue one time on how to develop a lot of traffic to your site. You know what you do? You set up a link with their name on it. And Google, when people are Googling Billy Graham Crusade, I have a link on my website that says Billy Graham on it. Because I won't show up at the top of the search engine, but I'll be down on the first few pages. Because I have him on my link. So I've listed about 150 different ministries on my link. Because <laughs> anytime people are Googling any of those ministries, they're going to eventually, within a page or two, land on my website. It's a little trick that somebody showed me on how to develop a lot of traffic to your site. You can pick up these little things that really help your presence. Keep, keep it updated. Keep your website updated. Isn't it terrible when you finally find something, some information you want, and you find it's six years old? The website doesn't know the age of anything on it. So you keep your own material updated. That's very important. People love to read on the internet. I received a call all the way from Africa from a pastor that had read my book on Isaiah 58. Not only did he read it, he read it live to his whole church. I ended up ministering in a church all the way in Africa, in Nigeria, by a pastor standing up a whole service and reading my book to his people, just by being on the Internet. Try not to make it look super spiritual. I personally don't, don't like inter Internets that have doves, you know, flying and... I mean, websites and Bibles rotating and crosses and that kind of thing. People make a choice within two or three seconds when they click your site. Make your site look interesting, maybe a little unusual. You know, the most watched videos on the Internet are weird videos. Maybe you want to do a weird video with a gospel embedded into it somehow. You know what I mean? These crazy things on the Internet, I mean, just funny, man. And... Uh, You've got to kind of be careful what you watch, of course, but on YouTube and some of these, they, ha they have filtering. They take care of the, the pornography and stuff that comes on there, at least mostly, unless you subscribe to the other. So you have an opportunity with everybody else to get your message out there. Let's go into television quickly on the top of page 50. Something people don't realize that public television opens the door free of charge for you and the community. And I see who gets on public television locally here in Tampa, and man, there's some strange ducks on there. But you'd be amazed how many watchers or pe uh, people they have that watch their programs. You have as much access to public television as anybody else in the city, and it's free of charge. All you have to do is take a producer's course. Once you complete the producer's course, along with the editing section, you have access to the studio to go in and tape your program. You can be on television free of charge through public television. And it's the people that are aggressive that are getting out there with it. Like I say, there's some pretty strange dogs on there because we've allowed them to take it over. But uh, there's, some good, there's some good ministries on, on public television as well. You used to do a lot of it out in Clearwater, didn't you, uh, uh, Socrates? Yes. You were on weekly. Yes, weekly, three times a week. Three times a week, public television yeah. with the That's theater. Yeah, the county closed that particular public television. But there's really a good one downtown Tampa. That's very, it's rated one of the top as one of the best studios in America. And you, they let you check out camera equipment free of charge. Once you get established relationship with them, you can take the camera equipment and actually do remote show, shoots around the city. Public television opened up with some federal grants and different things, and, and it's accessible to everybody. So television is open to many people through public television. All you do is have to do is to take a production course. If you're going to do that, I suggest you do at least four things. I don't know why I put five here because I read my book and there's only four. So that's all you're going to have to face on the test. Number one, build your own video production team. 
If you decide to do public television, don't get in over your head. Get a few of your friends together and say, we will do this together. Train your people how to do camera work, how to do production, how to do video editing. Number two, learn how to script your program. There's a lot of help out there, and they'll even help teach you through public television. They have courses. Number three, utilize remote shooting. It's interesting to go down to the beach or whatever and shoot something remotely. Adds a lot of color to your program. And number four, have the, your website up and running because public television does not let you advertise on it. That's the restriction. But you can have your website at the bottom. The whole half hour you're on, you can be publishing your website on the public television as it's playing. And it sends people to your website. Then you can promote what you want on the website. Okay, number six, experiencing the harvest through mission trips. How many have been on a mission trip here? Okay, a number of you. I'd encourage you to do it. There are two, there, these principles on mission trips, I, I've, we've taken so many overseas. We use the power of praise and worship mainly in these mission trips. And if you do a mission trip with a group, I, I just can't imagine doing any, anything in other countries where you don't include praise and worship. And also move in signs and wonders. Go do miracles. Practice the kingdom of God. All right? That's number two down there. Move in signs and wonders. Use power evangelism as you go out. Training is important, uh, top of 51. Training is important before going on a short-term mission. I know we're moving kind of quickly, but I want to cover the bases here, all right? We've got 15 minutes. Number one, you need to understand the culture and customs of the people. Make sure if you're going overseas, you study a little bit about that nation. Do you know that if you sit in Japan with your legs crossed and your shoe aiming towards somebody, it's an insult? Do you know that? It's a cultural thing. There are certain things you do in countries. There are certain things you don't do. There are cultural preferences. We, we took a trip, one of our early trips to Romania, and one of our ladies had, had cut off sleeves on her blouse. Well, we arrived in Romania. She had to go out and buy some clothing. Do you realize they would not even let her in the churches or in public squares with, with cut off sleeves? That was back in the 80, uh, late 80s, early 90s. That's changed now. But I'm just saying you need to understand the culture before you go there. Number two, how to pack. It's always interesting to show up to, go, to leave on the airplane and some lady has six suitcases. <laughs> She's bringing her whole war robe, you know. You got to pack properly and there's, a, you know, you shouldn't take more than just basically the clothes on your back and a few other minor things, really. You don't need a lot and it just burdens the whole trip when you do that. You get over there, what you do is you land in these third world countries and they come out in a little Volkswagen. They're going to haul four of you. You know, it's always interesting when you go to Haiti and some of these countries to see a family of four riding on a little scooter. It happens all the time. One child in the father's lap, one child in the mother's holding off the side, and she's riding in the back of the scooter, and it's not a big scooter. You see it all the time. So when they show up to pick our team up, you know, and all at once, you know, they have to hire another vehicle just to carry the luggage. So pack right. Understand each person's role. We took a team to Romania and we stayed in uh, Austria for three days and trained because we knew when we got to Romania, we had to be able to set up the equipment within 12 minutes or the police would stop us. It was right after the fall of communism and the Securitate was still operating on the streets trying to rough arm everybody. So we could set up our entire sound system with generator, speakers, keyboard, and everything in 12 minutes and start worshiping before the police arrived. Happened in every city plaza. We had one guy that went along just to go down to the police station and argue for two hours while we did our outreach. <laughs> Never forget Alex, man. He was, he was like a Russian mafia guy. So he'd come to the police when they came over to try to stop us, and he said, may I help you? And they say, well, you can't do this. And he said, well, yes, we can. This is now a free country. And so they'd say, well, you come down to the police station. And he knew how to argue with them in Romania. He's Romanian. He knew how to argue for two hours in Romanian so we could finish our outreach. And we never had one outreach shut down in Romania. That was our strategy. <laughs> Everybody had their part. When we landed in a plaza, man, and things came out of that truck, you wouldn't believe it. Everybody had an assigned place, and we were up worshiping in 12 minutes. We timed it. And it worked. Never got shut down once. Ministered to thousands. Handed out a lot of Bibles. Once you get started worshiping, the people of Romania wouldn't let the police stop us anyway. 
when they just knew they got that freedom. They had that new freedom. Be spiritually prepared. When you, before you go, make sure you're ready for this trip on these mission trips. And then be prepared to teach on the kingdom of God. You, the overseas, they want to understand the kingdom. They get it when you, when, you, when you share it. All right. Well, let's get into the final section here. We only have 12 minutes, but you'll like this, all right? We're going to finish on a real good note, and that is the world harvest. The world harvest. God really began to lead us. Twelve men began to gather once a week for prayer up in West Chase at a country club. A boardroom in the country club building. God had given me a word that he was changing our ministry three years ago into more of a world focus. I said, Lord, how am I going to do this? And the Lord said, gather 12 men and pray. So we did for a year. We just prayed every Thursday morning. And God gave us a plan. And here's the plan. Now that we've looked at the simple tools of witnessing, the methods that have been effective here in America, let's go global for a few minutes, all right? See how we can reach nations with the kingdom of God, how it's expanding. This exciting study manual will be both a challenge and inspire you to think as God thinks. For God so loved the what? The world that he gave. God thinks globally, and we, as well as individually, and so should we. Now, we've, we've arrived at the greatest season of harvest the world has ever seen. Do you know that more people have received Jesus in the last decade than in the history of the church? In the last 12 years, more people have come into the kingdom of God worldwide than have been saved up to that time from the beginning of history. It's exploding exponentially. It's happening. There are 15,300 dialects in the world. 15,300 dialects. We talked about that on the first night. Ethnos dialectic groups. This is according to the Joshua group, which researches this. They've got pages and pages of lineages and downloads of, of tribal groups in every country of the world. They've spent hours, they've spent years researching this out. There are 6,700 dialectic groups that still have not been reached. 6,700. 6,700 that have never been reached. These are the most unreached nations that are now going to, we're going to read these. India has a total of 2,332 dialects and 2,082 have still not been reached. So India is the most unreached portion of the world. Has a billion souls that have never heard the gospel one time and 22,000 people in India die every day never hearing about Jesus. Take a deep breath. Three people just died in India, never heard the gospel one time during your breath. We have a job to do. Pakistan, we have a great presence in Pakistan. There are 473 dialects and 468 have never heard the gospel. China has 499 dialects and 406 still haven't heard. Nepal has 403 dialects and 388 have never heard the word. Bangladesh has 373 and 341 have still not heard the word. So the 1040 window is still the unreached part of the world. Now we have a battle to reach these people. And let's look at that battle quickly in page 53. Number one, we have a spiritual battle because we're trying to territorialize the kingdom of God. Why do you think there's such poor persecution right now in India? Oressa, India has just suffered an enormous attack. We heard about it at the missions conference if you were here. They've come in and literally killed hundreds of Christians, burned down churches. Why is this happening? Because the gospel is getting so aggressive in India, the enemy is really upset. The enemy is losing ground. I found out when I went to India what the problem is. The, Brahmin, the Brahmins own the territory. They own the properties. They own the land. The Brahmins are huge over there. So they've got all these squatters on their land that work for nothing. They may have a thousand squatters living on their land that farm that land for these Brahmins. What happens? The gospel comes in and the people realize they've been under oppression. They get set free and the Christians no longer want to be under the oppression of the Brahmins. That's one of the main reasons. There's civil strife in India. They're losing their workers. But they're not fair with them. They don't pay them anything. They just give them a little land. 
So, you know, there's a lot of issues when you start dealing with the spiritual issues of some of these nations. Second is the people challenge. The unreached part of the world, most of the people will live in remote, isolated areas. Number one, they live in remote, isolated areas. They have a language and cultural barrier most of the time, which we hear of the dialects. Number C, they have religious fundamentalism, such as Islam. Hard to reach. I maybe have this later, but for example, A Afghanistan, 48,000 mosques and not one church. Not one Bible store. Not one Christian television or radio station in Afghanistan. My take on the war is, and I could be wrong, God will allow a lot of things to happen so the gospel will go forth. We've had a lot of missionaries in Afghanistan called American soldiers who read their Bibles, have Bible studies, who witness and share their faith by kindness to these, work, these people. So God, I believe, has allowed a presence in Afghanistan through the American troops and troops from other nations. I believe it's happened. Could be one of the reasons why we're over there. It's a positive reason in the middle of everything else. The third is political and national challenge. Many countries are closed to Christianity. I just mentioned Afghanistan. 48,000 mosques, but not a Christian church of any kind. So countries, some countries are literally closed. They've got to be prayed through and entered into from uh, a different angle, such as, such as the war. There's a lot of occupational missionaries from the Philippines, for example, that work in the Arab Emirates. The Philippines are especially adept at working as hospital workers in some of these nations. I have a good friend of mine that's a, uh, one of the top people down at the Tampa General. He was a personal hospital administrator for a sheik that owned a hospital over in Saudi Arabia. That sheik allowed him to have Bible studies in that hospital with his workers. So occupational missions is very powerful in some of these countries. The fourth is the church challenge. 85% of all cross-cultural missionaries minister among nominal Christian groups. So what we're doing is we're sending Christian missionaries over to minister to Christians. We're not reaching the unreached. The real tragedy is less than one half of one cent percent goes to reach the unreached people groups, which is over 30 percent. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound right to me. Seems like all uh, at least 30 percent of mission dollars should go to reach the 30 percent that have never heard. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's not happening. For every one million Muslims, there are less than three missionaries. So we're not reaching these parts of the world. And I love missionaries. We work with missionaries. God's used them to prepare the way. We have great missionaries that, are, that have gone out of this church that we support. But let me tell you, the best way to reach nations is through national indigenous teams. Empowering the nationals. You know what our teams cost us in Pakistan and Nepal and India? Our teams cost us $100 a month each. We get four full-time evangelists that go to four unreached villages every month for $100. I'm sending these $100 checks around the world every month, and we get four full-time evangelists. You know the average pastor salary in India is $25, U.S. dollars a month? So we're just paying. We were told not to pay more than that for our evangelists, that that is a reasonable salary in India is $25 U.S. dollars. It's not what they translate their money into over there. They're happy for it. And out of that, they go into remote villages and preach the gospel every week in four unreached villages. Our teams do. Our team in Chennai reaches four to 5,000 souls a month, goes to all these villages around Chennai. There are 500 villages surrounding a city of 10 million people. And our team is out. What we do is we show 35 minutes of the Passion movie, just the last section of the Passion movie. We show worship, integrity worship. We have 69 integrity worship songs that they show. And then the nationals get up and preach for a half hour. So the whole service in the plaza is about an hour and a half long. We give them sound system, generator, DVD player, video projector. Uh, we give them all the tools. We buy those tools. We give it to the national team with a generator, and they go out, and they take the gospel to unreached villages every week. So that's our approach, and we, we love it. It's working well. 
we're reaching these nations. So pray for us. If you want to get involved in any way and go on a mission trip with us over there, we'd love to have you. If you want to read more about it, we have a little mission statement card over on the table. Just grab it. Read through what we do there. For the price of a good used car, can you believe that? For the price of a good used car, you can have your own mat team that will start 100 churches in three to five years in remote villages. That sounds to me like a good investment. So we're encouraging people to join in. We've had churches uh, uh, in different parts of America that are joining in with us. And we have a church up at Dixon, Illinois, that literally has taken over all of Haiti now for us. They've done a phenomenal job up in a city called uh, Sarazen. They've dug a water well there. They put up a chicken and a fish farm. They're supporting their pastors and their 100 churches they're starting in remote villages there in that part of Haiti through the chicken and fish farm. They've also set up a cyber cafe at the church. The only cyber cafe I understand that all that part of Haiti. That's pretty exciting. So now they connect with their own team down there every week by internet. The whole thing's run by generator and hooked up to satellite. So we live in a pretty incredible time to do this. This is exciting. Any questions about that? Maybe some of you had a question about our, our, our plan for reaching the nations. But we believe in the national indigenous people. I think I mentioned it the first night. We laid out a business plan just to see what could happen. I have no idea if this is even going to begin to happen, but we laid it out. Alan Stamper, I don't know if you know Alan. Some of you may know him here in the church. Alan is a businessman that deals with large corporations, teaches them how to put together business plans. So we did this. We took a world map. We're in, we now have national directors in 17 nations, and we're ready to launch teams in these 17 nations now. And just those nations alone cover about 90-some percent of the unreached people groups of the world. So we're, we're, we're positioned. We're ready to go. We're like a rocket on the launching pad that's ready to be fueled and taken off. So pray for us. But we estimated to the best of our ability that 7,808 MAT teams, each starting 100 churches and each having a training center with Beacon University materials, because the same system they use in remote villages, they use Monday through Wednesday in their local church to train pastors. So we've started... World Mission Training Centers in these churches. And every one of our training centers are filled with every course, filled to the maximum that we allow. So the courses we hear here, they, they're listening to over there and getting translated if they need the translation. It's pretty exciting. So we're raising up 100 pastors around each MAT team to reach 100 villages in three to five years. Can't be done. It's a multiplication. So just pray for us. We have right now 12 teams. But it's a start. It's a start. Amen? Amen? And I'm excited to realize that every day I get up, every morning I get up, we're having at least 12,000 people come to Christ every month through our MAT teams. They, they win an average of 1,000 souls each a month and start two churches every month. Every one of our MAT teams are challenged to start two churches out of the four villages they go to each month. Not hard to start a church in a third world country in a remote village. It doesn't have to be fancy. But they're doing it. So we live in this age that we can complete the harvest. We can finish the task. So praise God. Amen? Amen. Don't have time for Joshua. The three points are define your territory, defend your territory, and declare your territory. I wish we had time to teach on that in closing. I was just going to leave you that challenge. But define your territory. God told Joshua, every place the sole of your foot treads upon, I have given to you this territory. Every one of us carry a territory in our life. Do you know that? An influence, a realm of authority, a dominion, so to speak. God has made us kings and priests. You are a king and a priest of your territory. Amen. And that is a place where you work. It's the place you influence by your life. It's the people in your life. It's the wealth that you have. Because king's wells are determined by land and ownership of possessions. That goes against some of the thing we taught about the world. But I'm just saying, you may, you may be influential financially. You may have money. You have a dominion over that. That's God's place that under your dominion. You're a steward of that money, that land, so to speak. So define your territory. Then secondly, defend it. Three times God told Joshua, be strong and of good courage. I will not leave you nor forsake you. God's not going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. He's going to allow us to walk out our kingship and our priesthood. As believers. And then finally, declare your territory. 
Speak it out every day. Say, thank you, God, that you have placed this in my hands and I take responsibility for it and accountability. And I'm going to walk in integrity with you as a king and a priest. And I'm going to declare your kingdom come in my life and your will be done. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. You've been so patient. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, Lord. Let's go evangelize. Amen. It's time. We covered a lot of ground. Lord be with you.